Okay, hello everyone. And welcome for all people here in the room and people connected in Zoom for attending this new colloquium from the Severo Ochoa program of the IAA in Granada in Spain. So it's our pleasure today to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Elena Comenco, or Comenco, if we will say that the, the Spanish way. <laughs> and so uh, uh, Elena is uh, made a PhD in physics and maths uh, in the main astronomical observatory in Kiev, in Ukraine in 2004, and currently she is a research scientist at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias in, in Spain. So she has been was mostly working in solar physics, uh, magnetohydrodynamics wave theory, theory of partially ionized plasmas, uh, quite some magnetic fields, and spectropolarity. Uh, one of her research lines is the study of the interaction of solar waves and magnetic structures. The main milestone of this line is the creation of a numerical code called Mancha 3D, a nonlinear code that solves the equations of non-ideal non magneto dynamics in three spatial dimensions, including realistic ingredients. Her current interest focuses on the investigation of the influence of partial ionization on, of the solar plasma onto the processes of energy propagation and release. And for this, she got funding from both the European Research Council starting grant in 2011 and a consolidated grant in 2017. And today she will be talking to us about multi-fluid solar atmosphere. So Elena, thank you very much for accepting the, accepting the invitation to give this talk on the floor. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you for those who came. <laughs> I understand that probably solar topic is far from somebody's here. So let me let me start introducing the topic. So I will be uh, presenting today the latest results of uh, what we have been doing in our group, as I see, in the last almost uh, 10 years, maybe eight years. And the topic of this, as you see, is multi-fluid solar chromosphere. So what we do is we study solar chromosphere, but uh, we do it uh, differently from uh, the standard approach that has been there in the field. So we try to go beyond a uh, standard magnetohydrodynamic approach, okay? So I will explain later what that means. And for those of you who don't know what the chromosphere is, but of course everybody knows, Chromosphere is called chromosphere because, of course, during the eclipses, we observe this uh, beautiful image. We can see these uh, prominences, these uh, features, clouds here, that you can see them actually in this red color because you can reach alpha emit in there in the red. And that's why it's called chromosphere. So it's a very narrow layer, uh, about 1,500 kilometers in the atmosphere of the sun, which is below the bottommost level, the photosphere and the corona. And this layer is interesting because it's sometimes it's called like purgatory of solar physics because it's kind of a layer which uh, you cannot study using many approximations because everything is kind of out of equilibrium. So you don't have radiation in equilibrium, you don't have the plasma parameters in equilibrium. You cannot approximate that uh, something is uh, strongly magnetic or strongly plasma dominated, etc. So everything is more or less the same order of magnitude in the chromosphere, and that's why it's so difficult to study it theoretically. And of course, we know that chromosphere is a region where our solar eruptions originate, and from there, they drive magnetic field lines in the corona, and then we have flares, we have coronal mass ejections, and space vessel, etc., etc. Then um, there are a couple of big questions regarding the chromospheric physics. So one of these questions is, is this uh, fantastic dynamics that we see in this layer. So what you see in the two, for example, it's quite an old movie that has been taken at the Swedish uh, Solar Telescope in La Palma Island. And you see here changes uh, through the H-alpha spectral length of power. So when it comes to the continuum of H-alpha, you see the granulation structure, which is the photospheric level. And then when it goes higher up through the, through the line profile, you start seeing the fibrils. And the fibrils are the chromosphere. So these things are one on the top of the other. So you see the uh, chromosphere has completely different structuring. And these tiny fibrils, they also follow magnetic fields and they have um, also, they also very highly dynamic. And then, uh, of course, on the top of that, there is a big question of chromospheric or also coronal fibrils. Because also we know from observations, from observations of spectral lines in the chromosphere, because we see them in the mission, we know that the temperature on average behaves like this black line. So we have a rise of the temperature in the chromosphere. But if this uh, 
atmosphere was in the thermodynamical and radiative equilibrium, we should have something like a green line here. And this difference is, uh, it needs to be explained somehow. So we know that this cannot be supplied by the radiative energy. So this needs to be supplied by some mechanical energy or some magnetic energy. So the question here is how to explain this chromospheric rise. And then finally, why do we have transition region in, in the hot corona? So there are like big questions about the chromosphere, about the heating mechanisms, and about the structure and dynamics. And this is what we globally try to answer in our project. So if we talk about, uh, let's talk about starting conditions. So what do we have there? So we have um, here, for example, it's an example of a recent modeling that uh, a postdoc of my group has been doing, Ana Maria Navarro, which shows how beautiful loops uh, expanding in colon. So this is an image that shows a part of the subsurface layers of the sun, photosphere, chromosphere, and then corona. So we have a um, solar atmosphere, which is extremely strongly specified medium. So from a point of view of a plasma physicist, when everybody wants to study plasmas which are unbounded, homogeneous, everything is nice and, and easy to, to resolve, this is not the case here because we have a very strong gravitational amplification. So your density here in this vertical direction, it changes by orders of magnitude. So it's all very, very stratified and also in the horizontal direction, it's all very homogeneous. But then uh, we also have a photosphere, which is a region which is marked here, about 500 kilometers, where we have uh, a gas, because it's not a plasma, we have a gas which is strongly collisionally coupled, but it's very, very weakly ionized. It's only one or about 10,000 particles, or even less, which is actually an ion there. So it's almost neutral gas. And this fact, it has been known for a long time from the point of view of radiative transfer, because you know that this is neutral hydrogen there. But from the point of view of plasma physics, somehow people prefer to close their eyes and prefer to think that this is still a plasma. So it's kind of contradictory, right? Because you have something which is almost neutral, but you have it's very, very strongly conditionally coupled. So even this single ion that is somewhere there, it also produces a strong effect because we see it in observations. But we need to take this into account. And then in the chromosphere, which is like here, we still have a half neutral plasma. So we have half neutrals and half charges. But then uh, since we go to the chromosphere, it's higher up. We have density, which is much lower. And in this situation, our collisional coupling becomes weaker. So we have these two populations of charges and neutrals that are not fully collisionally coupled. So just imagine they're like blue balls and red balls, and then they move separately together. So if uh, we had like a situation when everything is fully, fully collisionally coupled, so everything should move like a single stream. But because of this lack of collisional coupling, because of the very low densities, these populations, they can move differentially with respect to each other. And this is produced, this is what produced this multi-fluid effects in the chromosphere. But then on the top of that, of course, we have corona, which is again fully uh, ionized, but then it's almost collision, collisionless. So it's a very interesting system from the uh, theoretical point of view. And in order to understand it, uh, it's important to break big questions into the smaller questions, because always when you want to answer some big question, you don't know from where to start. It's very frequent. So the problem seems too big to you to start from. So it's important to break these big questions into smaller questions and then smaller questions into tasks. And then these tasks you can do little by little and finally probably you can have your problem solved. So uh, if you break these big questions into small ones, we can ask, for example, the following. So how is it possible that we have magnetic connectivity between the sub interior of the sun and corona through this layer of almost neutral plasma in between. So how is this magnetic field lines? How do they continue through this layer? And what are the effects caused by neutrons? And then the next question, okay, maybe we need to take, we need to care about that, but is it technically possible and feasible to model ion neutral interactions in realistic solar conditions? So is it possible to create the models like the one we see here but fully taking into account the presence of neutrals. And the last question is, do we need to care about this at all? I mean, do we have any observational confirmations of this ion neutral effects? Or maybe there are some hints or whatever. So what do the observations actually tell us about this? 
And if I lose you on my way of talking here, I start to directly jump to the conclusions. Okay, so, so you there are some take take home messages. Okay, here. So yes, uh, I will try to convince you in the rest of my talk that neutrals uh, are very important because they can efficiently convert magnetic energy into the thermal energy and hit the chromosphere. Okay. Then uh, in the stratified atmosphere, like the one of the sun, the ion neutral effects, they become, they manifest themselves at low, rather low frequencies. So this is not like plasma frequencies where you have to go to very high, um, high frequencies. In the stratified atmosphere, uh, you can see this effect actually at frequencies of the order of millihertz. Then, uh, yes, we can model ion neutral interactions in realistic situations. Situations is in single or multi fluid, but we need a hell of a numerical resolution to do that. So, our current numerical volumes, they don't resolve it fully. And then it's very important this multi fluid effects are especially prominent at the borders of cool coronal features like coronal rain and coronal prominences. And then, yes, observations, they may start showing hints for this uncoupled behavior of ions and neutrons. Okay, so these were my conclusions, but let's hear the first the full story before. Okay, so I will be talking about models of waves, magnetoconvection, cool coronal features, and some observations here. So let's start from something very simple. Let's transport some energy by means of, of waves. So we uh, have solar waves of a typical frequency of the order of, of a millihertz, which are periods between three and five minutes. This has been known. And we also have been told that multi-fluid effects, uh, they start to be important when your charged neutral collisional frequency is of the order of the wave frequency. And this conclusion came from the modeling in unfolded and homogeneous plasma. It's logical because when your wave uh, particles, they start to collide with each other, then of course, if your wave frequency is similar to the collisional frequency, your wave cannot propagate, and of course you break your wave, and then this effect becomes important. But then, uh, if this is like that, so one doesn't have to worry about multi-fluid effects still very high frequencies of the order of hertz. So let's see, in, in the sun, here are the typical collisional frequencies. Mm -hmm. So this is the collisional frequency in seconds minus one, and this is the height in the photosphere and the chromosphere, okay? So we have to, to care about two values, the charges neutral collisional frequency and neutral charges collisional frequency, because it's not the same to collide one neutral with many charges or one charge with many neutrals, right? So it's a different thing. So the important quantity here is neutral charges collisional frequency because it's how our neutrals transmit momentum to the charges. And this is of the order of 10 to the 2 seconds minus 1. Our wave frequency is three orders of magnitude below here. So it's much, much, much lower. But still, let's try to make a simple experiment and just try to propagate a magnetoacoustic wave through the chromosphere and have a situation which is like that. So we have a gravity pointing downwards. We have a horizontal magnetic field, which is also supported by observations. And we have a wave propagating transverse to this magnetic field. So this will be fast magnetoacoustic wave. So if we do so, we can obtain something like in this picture, where we have these waveforms as a function of height in the chromosphere. So we have them uh, for three wave periods, one of uh, one second, three seconds, and five seconds. Okay, these are not five minute oscillations, but these are seconds. This is really high frequency, but at least these are not hertz. Okay, so this frequency we can, is a good instrumentation, we can try to attempt to measure already. Like five, 10 second waves, we can already mirror in the sun. So you see what happens to these waves. They start propagating in a stratified atmosphere and their amplitude increases with height because of the density decreasing. So we want to convert, we want to conserve kinetic energy. So our velocity increases in response to the density decrease. But then after some height, you see that this wave, instead of increasing, it goes away. So it's kind of a decrease of the wave amplitude and then after some height, for some periods, these waves disappearing. So this is uh, what ion neutral collisions are doing. Okay, so if, for example, but again, I mean, it, at no place we cross the height where this wave frequency is actually equal to the collision frequency. So this happens at frequencies 
which are significantly higher than the collisional frequencies. And this is because you see the situation where uh, UV frequency is equal to collisional frequency, then this wave is dumped in one period, okay? And then it's gone. Here you see the situation that it needs many periods of this wave to actually go away. But since this wave is very high frequency, so it eventually will go away, okay? And it will not reach even the height where it should be dumped through this effect. The curious thing from here is that as we go to higher periods, to lower frequencies, the curves, these red and green curves that you see here, they start to separate. And it means that our charges and our neutrals, they start behaving separately. So oscillation in charges and neutrals, it's a different oscillation now. And that happens in the volume where plasma beta is smaller than one, so if a magnetically dominated situation. So the conclusion from this is actually gravity and this charge neutral dumping, these are two competing effects. And what they do is actually producing this high frequency waves to be linearly dumped. Uh, before they show in any significant ion neutral decoupling, but for the low frequency waves, they actually can reach higher, they will be still dumped, but then we will show this decoupling. Okay? And then you may want to ask me, so why do I at least care about this decoupling? So I care about this decoupling because if we decouple velocity of charges and neutrals, then we have a frictional friction between these components and we have a frictional heating. And a result of this frictional heating, we will have an increase of plasma temperature at the places where this frictional heating is the maximum. So according to the same, the same study here, uh, if we compute the temperature increase as a function of, of height and also different curves are different times for all these three waves, we see that uh, first they produce a temperature increase at different places in the chromosphere. So the short period waves, they increase the temperature at the bottom, but then longer period waves, they propagate higher. And if you continue in this direction, so we will hit like higher and higher layers, that means of these waves. And also since uh, these guys here, they have been able to increase the amplitude more than other ones, they also hit more, okay? So this is a kind of a counterintuitive result here because uh, we have been told that the most important waves for these effects are actually high frequency waves. And what we see is the contrary. We see that actually lower frequency waves, they reach higher, they can decouple, and they can hit more and in higher layers. Okay? And this is because we taken into account the stratification. So we conclude that yes, uh, ion neutral heat uh, friction is a good candidate for heating the solar chromosphere in any of these multi-fluid or single fluid descriptions. You need strong magnetic field to decouple charges and neutrals. So this would only happen where you have small plasma beta. So you have to have your magnetic forces important enough to decouple your neutrals from your charges. And then also this result, which is counterintuitive. So our low frequency waves they actually hit more and at higher heights. Okay. So this was just a simple example. Now, if we go to the sun, we know that the whole sun is magnetic. So if we go to the very quiet magnetic, magnetically quiet region of the sun, like this one shown here, which is a famous map by Hinode that was analyzed, I don't know how, how many studies it has been analyzed, in many, many studies. So this is one of the most studied maps of the quiet sun, I think, in the history of solar physics, probably. Uh, you may see that this is boring, but of course it's not, because if you look at this in polarization, you see that this is full of magnetic fields. So this is full of this um, salt and pepper pattern, which reflects the action of what we believe uh, now is a small scale solar dynamo. Okay. So these are very, um, let's say, rather weak magnetic field compared to sunspots, but still they concentrate itself in these bigger patches which correspond to, to, to network and the internetwork and the interiors of this internetwork. So magnetic field is everywhere. But also we know that this magnetic field is located in the region where we have a lot of neutrals. So we want to ask ourselves a question, what are the consequences of this quasi magnetic field for the heating of the solar chromosphere? So now we have a mechanism that we can dissipate this magnetic field. So can we really heat the chromosphere by means of, of this quiet sun magnetic field? So for that, we have been doing uh, lots of simulations of realistic magnetic convection recently and published several papers. And our strategy lately has been 
performing very short time series of these simulations, they will reproduce data like the one shown here, which is a piece of the sun here in the photosphere. And then we do these simulations in several um, magnetic field configurations. So we do small scale dynamo, but we also compare with some kind of unipolar uh, vertical, initially vertical magnetic field, which more resembles maybe network regions. And also we do this in uh, three different resolutions. We do this at 20, 10, and 5 kilometer resolutions in order to see the convergence of these multi-fluid effects. And we do this by adding or removing different ingredients. So we either have uh, simulations where we, we call it clean, so we just have a poor MHD situation, or we have simulations where we add, for example, ambipolar diffusion, which is equivalent of ion uh, neutral friction. Okay? So I will be comparing this. And then we run short time series to be able to compare the snapshots one to one. So, uh, for example, this compares the models with different resolutions. This snapshot gives us the velocity, vertical velocity field at the height of the middle chromosphere at two different resolutions, at 20 kilometers and at five kilometer resolution. So you may see that if you have done this at five kilometer resolution, you don't want to do this at 20 anymore because it looks much better. So you have all these shock crons well resolved, you have all this turbulence and vorticity and everything, much better result. And the dynamics of these layers is really, really interesting. So on the left, again, I'm showing the vertical velocity. And on the right, I'm showing the vertical component of the magnetic field at the corresponding height <coughs> in the chromosphere. So you see that uh, the chromosphere is made of shocks. You don't see the granulation pattern anymore. This height, what you see is this collision of different, different shock waves producing vortices. And the corresponding magnetic field is also very violent. So you see it's also black and white salt and pepper pattern here. But of course, at this resolution of the numerical data, you see it much better than in the observations. So you see it very clearly, like magnetic sheets and, and everything that is found here. So this situation is much more difficult to analyze, to analyze than these simple waves that I have shown to you before. Okay, So this is really difficult to disentangle different physical mechanisms that are taking place here. Um, because you have waves, you have convection, you have vortex flows, you have shocks, and, and all this plays a relevant role. And if you change the magnetic field, then it starts looking completely different. This is another model where instead of this uh, small scale dynamo, what we did is to implant it initially a vertical magnetic field of 50 Gauss, and then we let it evolve. And then eventually in the chromospheric heat, you have something like that. So your flow in the chromosphere, the one on the left, it has a completely different pattern. So you have all these kind of flower-like structures, and these are different types of waves that we have there. These are not acoustic shocks, but these are fast magnetic acoustic waves, essentially. And also in magnetic fields, you have a completely different structure. You don't have this black and white salt and pepper pattern, but you have patches of a homogeneous unipolar field and this field be in functions that we have there. And I don't think they have been observed, but maybe they can be observed as well. So these are different models, okay? And then we want to compare them and we want to see if we, by adding a bipolar diffusion into these models, we are able to hit the chromosphere. Okay? So so for that, uh, we first uh, analyze these models and we check if, for example, they, they have <coughs> similar properties such as the magnetic field and quantum flux, etc. So for example, this shows how the average magnetic field changes this height in all these three models. In the black curves, uh, these are the runs for the small scale dynamo. And in blue and red, these are unipolar runs with different magnetic fields here. So you can see, for example, that for the small scale dynamo, the magnetic field is going to zero in the upper layers, it's going to very small values. And this is because this field is typically very weak. So you have these small magnetic loops that close very low in the photosphere. Okay? But for the unipolar runs, the magnetic field continues quite high to the upper part of the domain, and then we form just magnetic cluster. So they could be different. You also may see that at slightly change in the resolution, your magnetic field becomes higher when you have a better resolution. And this is because the small scale dynamo depends on the Reynolds numbers. And of course, when you reduce the resolution, you increase the Reynolds numbers, 
your dynamo becomes more vigorous, and that's why you concentrate your magnetic field more, and you have stronger magnetic field here. But you can check here. But the question here is, we want to study ambipolar diffusion, and we want to check if we actually resolve this ambipolar diffusion by constructing models at higher and higher resolution. So for that, there is a simple check. So we can compute a parameter called lambda a, which is a typical ambipolar diffusion scale. And this is measured at the coefficient of diffusion divided by the Alvin speed. And the diffusion coefficient is proportional to the neutral number density squared to the magnetic field squared, and it's inversely proportional to collisions. And this is your Alvin speed. So we want to have our grid cell in our simulations to be of the order of this parameter, lambda a. And now we want to check how many grid points in our model actually satisfy this criteria. Okay. So this is what we do. And uh, here I'm showing again the map of temperature in gray and in color pixels are the locations where we satisfy this criterion. So where we actually resolve ambipolar diffusion effect. So you may see that, for example, for models with unipolar fields, this is quite unsatisfactory because all of this is gray and there are very few points which are colored. And here in the dynamo models, there are more points which are colored, but still there are a lot of gray areas. So I was a little bit disappointed when I did this because I put a lot of effort in producing these models in very high resolution. And then I found that nah, I still cannot resolve the unipolar diffusion <laughs> in most of the points. Uh, if we make statistics, we get something like this figure here. So it shows how many percent of the points of the volume we resolve as a function of resolution and the type of the model. And you may check here that at most for the best case of this dynamo model at five kilometer resolution, we resolve maybe 15, 17% of the points. So, okay, it's not much. But anyway, this is larger than zero. So <laughs> let's only select those points. And since we have snapshots where we can compare simulations with and without a certain effect, we can do that, okay? And we get something like that. So for this, I just uh, straight go straight forward and I subtract temperature in the models without ambipolar diffusion and this ambipolar diffusion. And this is at a function of time and I do it, I just average at heights and at pixels where we resolve ambipolar diffusion effect. So this shows the result of the dynamo. This is 50 Gauss implanted field, and this is 200 Gauss implanted field. You may see that in all the cases, uh, the differences, they increase in time. So ambipolar diffusion, it keeps hitting. So if you see there all the time, it will eventually hit your atmosphere. And then this difference, for, for example, 1,000 second is about 600 kilns, which is not, not a small effect. Hmm? Then uh, important thing is that for higher resolutions, the steep, the, the slope of this curve is different. So progressively high resolution, they give you progressively higher slopes, meaning that, uh, for example, for this dynamo, five kilometers that I couldn't run longer because I got run on the computing time, um, we would have even high increase, which means that we need to go to even higher resolutions to resolve this effect faster. But it's an important effect because this is a good check because this is a realistic situation all the agents are coming into play, and we see that we even this will have to go to very high resolution to resolve it, but still it's potentially very, very important. And another conclusion is that from all these models that we see here, the temperature increase is more or less the same. So all over the quiet sun will be hitting because of this effect. So this is the take home messages from this part. Okay. So yes, we can model this uh, situation, but we need much higher resolution to actually get the whole volume model correct. And then um, I try to move to another subject, which is a multi-fluid effect for the cool coronal features. So now you may have heard that it's very fancy to call about cooling of solar corona. <laughs> Actually, there will be a conference uh, next year in, in Leuven about coronal cooling. So it, they talk about coronal cooling because it's not because the corona is cool, but because uh, there are a lot of cool features in corona like coronal rain, like prominences, so other kind of condensations that are produced by cooling events in this medium. Okay? So that's why I also call about cool coronal features. These features are prominences, as you see here in this dash um, 
lines here, but it's also this coronal rain, which are the blobs of cool and dense plasma that falls following the magnetic field lines along the loops back to the chromosphere. So it's a very interesting, theoretically interesting phenomena. We believe that this is because there are some condensations of this plasma because of some cooling, cooling events. And there have been studies in 1D in multiple dimensions to understand why these blocks actually fall in at this particular speed. So for example, our colleagues from Palma de Mallorca, they have been modeling this in, in 1D and also using multiple theory. And they found actually that the speed of these bubbles is set by the balance between the gravity, so it's not free fall, and the magnetic pressure that is pushing back. Okay, so this is slower than a uh, free fall. Okay. But then what happens if we go to 2D? Okay. If we go to 2D, and this has been modeled by David Martin and Gomez in his recent paper, we have something like that. So you have your block of plasma like this. And a uh, vertical magnetic field is directed along this direction. Mm -hmm. So you see that this block of plasma falls along the magnetic field lines, and then there is this funny V shape that is also formed there. And this is because your density contrast along the block is different. And since the falling speed depends on the density contrast, the central part goes faster and the sides they go slower. So at the end, we form this V shape. Okay. If you do this without the magnetic field, which is the movie next here, it will be completely different because uh, magnetic field stops carrying him holds instability to develop. And if there is no magnetic field, you will have your block completely destroyed. So magnetic field really plays a very important role in, in those blocks falling. And it has been uh, seen also that the falling speed, they are different in 2D and in 1D if we compare these simulations. But we are interested not in just this effect. We want to study what happens if we add multi-fluid into this, okay? And this also has been done by, by David in his paper published last year. And he found the following, and it's very interesting. So you see these V shapes as we have seen before, but now this has been modeled in multi-fluid. So this gives us access to actually uh, separately understand what neutrals and charges are doing in this situation. And uh, for this, we plot these quantities which we call drifts, which can be horizontal or vertical. Horizontal drifts are differences between neutral and charge velocities in the horizontal direction. And vertical drifts are the same, but for the vertical velocities, okay? And these drifts are important because, as I say, when we have drifts, hmm, the square of these drifts is proportional to the frictional heating, which is equivalent to the bipolar heating. So once we have these drifts, once we decouple ions and neutrals, we have friction, and that produces a heating. And this is what we see also here in contours. So, you see here that there is a heating. So you see that along the trajectory of these coronal ring bubbles, when they fall to the chromosphere, along this trajectory in the transition region between this cold bubble and the hot corona, all the way you have high drifts, you have both them in vertical and horizontal directions, and you have associated frictional heating. And then this frictional heating translates into the temperature increase which is different for charges and for neutrals, but it's equivalently large and important. So in this region surrounding the drops, we have increased the temperature by a few kilocalories, which is a lot. So if we would observe this, for example, this would result probably in a bright feature surrounding these following drops in, in the data. This has not been observed yet, but we have been talking to Patrick and Tolaine and other colleagues to try to synthesize this and see if we can actually detect something like that. So the conclusion is that uh, all these cool coronal features, they have a transition layer. And in this transition layer, the particle fluid effects are extremely important because we decouple plasma parameters and then we heat. Okay? So this is really, really important. And it can be potentially observable. And then another feature like this is solar prominences, which sometimes are observed like a curtain of material that just falls to the solar disk. And these curtains uh, are frequently interpreted as relay Taylor instability. So you have this relay Taylor instability in all kinds of you know, astrophysical plasmas. Each time that you have something heavy on the top of something light, then you have these fingers following down. So the same happens in, in solar prominences. And also these prominences are made of material which is half neutral and not fully coupled by collisions. 
So similarly, we did lots of modeling of the late Taylor instability for different magnetic field configurations. And here there has been a series of work published by my former student Beatrice Pesco Braileno, where we included all kinds of multifluid physics into this. It was including viscosity, thermal conduction, non-equilibrial and initial combination, elastic collisions, frictional heating, everything has been there. And also we did this for different magnetic field configurations. So for example, in this, you, you have examples of the simulations. This is the density of charges, and this is the density of neutral in one of these, where the magnetic field was just perpendicular to the, to the board. And here, this magnetic field was not strictly perpendicular, but there is some magnetic component in the plane of the perturbation, and that's why you see this different. So actually, by looking at the simulations, we have been looking at them so for so long that we gave them names, actually, because this one, for example, this was a baby in the world because it looks like a baby in the womb. And this one we call the alien head, because it looks like that. <laughs> um, yeah. So this one has been analyzed most, the baby in the womb. So if you play the movie, we see how this develops. So initially you form these little fingers, and then they merge. And probably want to stop it. Oh, anyway, let's keep going. So. Um, what we see is that these blobs of uh, coronal plasma, it's rising up, and then the blobs of cool and uh, partially ionized chromospheric plasma is actually going down in these fingers. And then once these things evolve, these fingers, they are brought together by the flow, and there is, of course, reconnection happening there. And this is not like an ideal harris shit reconnection. This is actually a forced reconnection, whereas these blobs, they don't have much other choice and just collide together. So there is the current sheet forms there, and there are plasmoids and reconnection happening in this partially ionized plasma, and it's really, really interesting. I don't have time to, to stop on that, but if you have time, if you're interested, just read the papers. So uh, again, we can compute our ion neutral fields also in this situation. And this is what you show here. Again, I am showing the horizontal drifts on the left and vertical drifts on the right. The scale, uh, you may see here, it's in kilometers per second. So our maximum amplitude of the drift is about a kilometer per second, which is not a small quantity because a kilometer per second is something you can easily measure in the sun if you have enough resolution. The overall speed is about 20 kilometers. So it makes that decoupling, it's about between 5 and 10% of the overall speed, which is small, but it's not so small not to be detected. Okay, so this is something that we can actually try to go there and measure. An important thing here, you see that this, um, let's say, higher uh, decoupling, you can see this in colors, it follows the locations where we compress magnetic field and we have higher current densities. And it also responds to the theory because it's proportional to the current density, it should be proportional to the current density. So in all these regions surrounding these cool coronal features, you may expect that there is some decoupling. Okay. So the question is, can we actually measure this decoupling? So we have been uh, for quite some years uh, behind uh, this question and trying actually to <coughs> understand if we can observationally detect anything of this ion neutral drift because, okay, this is theoretically a very interesting project, but if we don't have any observational confirmation, then of course, why do you bother? No? Do you know this? So this is one of the examples of the work that we published back in 2016. And here again, I show you the formula for the, for the drifts. And you see that this ion neutral velocity difference is actually proportional to the current and to the magnetic field. So again, in the place where you have strong currents, you have compression of your material. And the boundaries of these coronal features is where you expect to have this. So we went to the VTT and we scanned this prominence that you see here. <laughs> with, a, with a slip, okay? making the scans very, very fast because we want to detect this phenomena very, very fast. It was very important. And make sure that we target an optically thin prominence plasma. So we make sure that our spectral lines, they form over the same volume of plasma. So in this campaign, we only had two spectral lines, which was the one of ionized calcium, the infrared, and the one of helium thin excerpt. And then uh, we measured only the velocity because we want to make it very, very quick. And here's an example. So this is the time evolution of, of the velocity along one of those slits. The black line is a calcium line and the red line is a helium one. 
So if you look at this, you see, uh, they're the same. No? They're completely the same. But if you pay a little bit more attention, so you see that calcium at peaks, very high peaks, slightly goes larger. And here it goes a little bit higher and a little bit lower. So calcium is a little bit deviating from, from this helium. Okay? So you do not expect large, uh, large uh, drips, but you do expect them. And especially if we now consider this velocity not as a function of time, but as a function of a spatial direction on this lid, you will see again the same thing. So the helium curve in red, it goes smoother, and the calcium curve in black, it goes a little bit higher than that. So at places mm -hmm. where we have strong spatial and temporal gradients, these lines start to behave slightly differently. Okay? So that goes in this direction. Then there were other independent studies, for example, by Eberhard Weir, and he also published another book in last year, where he also targeted an optically thin prominence plasma, but he used other spectral lines than those that we used. So he used, for example, strontium and potassium spectral lines. And then he plotted the velocities of the neutral line as a function of the velocities of the ionized line. And here is the bisector. So if all the points would be along this line, it means that the velocities are the same. But you see that there are some points that start deviating. And that happens right and the velocities which are larger. So again, we have higher velocities in both of the lines, and we have higher deviations. In a way that, again, our charges they move slightly faster than our neutrals. And then it has been more. For example, these papers that we just got a referee report today about this, and it was positive. <laughs> so we, we did the same. Again, it was a prominence of the VTT, but now we added more spectral lines to this study. So we have another neutral line. We have uh, H alpha, helium D3, and we again we have the calcium spectral line. And also we took a lot of care of eliminating uh, optically thick uh, plasma. So we, after considering all this prominence, we only have been able to reliably, let's say, measure these velocities at the very border of this prominence, where plasma is optically thin. But this is, again, it's very important to be at the border, because you have seen from theory that it's at the border where you have this decoupling. Okay? So we are at the border here as well. And then here is a snapshot of the differences between H-alpha and helium D3, two neutral lines, and also H-alpha and, and the calcium. So you see that there are differences also between two neutral lines. Okay, They are not the same. But the difference with the calcium line are higher. So again, the direction that our ion is slightly faster than our neutrons. And there have been other works also by Magic Tapir, and it also has kind of similar, similar conclusions. So each time we are at the border of the prominence, we can measure this decoupling. And this decoupling goes in the same direction. And that has been it. So these are my conclusions. These are my true conclusions not the fake conclusions. So definitely, uh, we conclude that multi-fluid effects are important in the chromosphere because they are important for waves. They produce wave dumping and frictional heating in the middle chromosphere. They are very important in the interference in the borders of the cool coronal structures, also because they produce frictional heating and also ion neutral decoupling. Uh, this effect is very important in reconnection. I didn't talk about that, but it's very important because for reconnection, you can get faster reconnection rates because of formation of plasmoids and all kinds of instabilities. In the current layers, because we dissipate currents through this mechanism, and this is an important agent for the chromospheric energy, uh, energy balance. In the magnetic convection flows, allowing for efficient conversion of magnetic energy into the heat. But here, we have to make uh, note that our best models, they don't even resolve the whole volume of this effect, only 15% of it. And also observations, they systematically reveal uh, that ions have slightly larger velocity than the neutrons. Okay? And there are some future prospects of these of this studies, you know, because of course no, not everything is so perfect. So we have been comparing, for example, single fluid and multi-fluid approximations, because single fluid is something that many people start having in their codes, and this is something which is relatively simply implementable into numerical codes. And we see now that this single fluid, which is much easier, it can be relatively <coughs> well used, for example, till the middle chromosphere, so you can be good with that. But then if you go higher up to the transition region and the atmosphere, definitely you need the multi-fluid because everything decouples. Then you need it. 
But for that, we need a much better theory of coupling, coupling between ionization and recombination and radiation in multiple. This has not been done yet by nobody. We need a better treatment of viscosity and conductivity because everybody is treating these coefficients using Braginsky from 1965 book. And uh, this is not true. These coefficients are not true because they have been computed for completely collisionally coupled plasma. And we are moving now to plasma which are not coupled by collisions. So there have been developments, like for example, this recent eight papers by Peter Hunana, who is also a postdoc at the SC in this regard. And of course, we need an adequate instrumentation for measure ion neutron effects. And this is the case and the And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, um, for this talk and for the question. I will invite David Dorosko, who invited Elena to manage uh, the questions. David. Okay. Thank you, Elena. Uh, very, very interesting, very nice, and very exciting topic, actually. I like a lot when you say that actually the sun in the photosphere is rather like that, than a plasma, but everybody says it's a uh, plasma, but it's not. It's something different. So. I want, I want to ask you if someone here in the in the room has any question uh, to to Lena. Yes, please. Yeah. Well, you, you saw what at the beginning uh, yeah. the message temperature of the chromosphere uh, is really much higher than the expected temperature yeah, in yeah. terms of relative equilibrium, and then you saw uh, how your this ion neutral grid uh, produces a heating. Yeah. In the chromosphere. So my question is: To what extent that uh, do you think that is enough to close that gap between observations and expectations? Or I think it is. From... It is one of the agents. Maybe like I would dare to say, like maybe fifty percent or more. But we are not yet there because mm -hmm. we don't model them correctly. We don't resolve them. That's the point. I mean, yeah. if we were able to produce models which we fully resolve, then yeah, then we will be able to answer this question. But not not yet. Yeah. Yeah. That, what's the resolution? I think it's below kilometer. So now we are, we are running like a um, thousand cube uh, simulations, and one snapshot is about 99 uh, gigabytes. <laughs> and if you want to increase this by a factor of, uh, let's say, five in each direction, <laughs> I mean, we, we can do this. I mean, technically, you can ask time and you can produce them, but this is technically analyzing this data, it's really, really, it's a help. You know? Yeah, it's more 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 Yeah, the well, these are, these are really tiny and they're famous, right? So we need high contrast, so we need better signal to merge ratio. But I believe that probably in eyes, we are kind of detecting these kind of shapes. Oh, so it's already like I think they are both. Yeah, um, yeah. Is it compatible to yeah, your yeah. model? Or? I would say that the existing shapes are, I don't know if they are one to one comparable, but I think you need that something. Like that. So, any more questions here in the, in the room? Yeah. And I don't know if someone in the, yeah. the Zoom session has a question. Yes, you have one question. So please open your uh, mic and do the question. We cannot hear it, even in Zoom, we cannot hear it. So it's not a problem of the speaker. Uh, so I, maybe you can try to I write think. a question in the chat because we cannot hear you. Okay, so, so maybe while we wait for the people in the Zoom to write down the questions, 
Uh, I do have kind of 175 questions, but uh, <laughs> we can, we can. Uh, I will just make maybe one, two, or three, basically. So my first question is, uh, is there any relationship between the unipolar diffusion, so ion neutrals interaction with the solar wind? Well, solar wind, I believe it's mostly plasma. I know that people are trying now to model solar wind including neutrals, and I have seen, I think, like a paper maybe. There's a saying that it slightly modifies its speed of the wind a little bit. I mean, what happens in Corona, because you, Corona is almost fully ionized, but still you have some neutral and they are not coupled, so they're still doing some transfer. So maybe it will 5-10% modify the wind. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What's the composition of the wind? Plasma. Plasma. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't know. Okay. My second question is regarding the resolution. So uh, I'm, I think I like a lot the Boltzmann equation. It is something that I like a lot reading. Right. It's something that I like Yeah, so uh, do we need at some point to even go in town and from MC to multiple in and then go to both and patient to make very big small Kind of considering that, but you know the problem is chromosphere is fixed particle collision of that particle and particles. So okay. it's, it's it's part of the People trying to do this, and it's um, technically possible to do, but in very small ways, maybe five years ago, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And maybe they are very technical, but not for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. well, it's a matter of technology, I think in 10 years, maybe we'll be doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Approach, Moshna. Yeah, okay. Спасибо. Замечательный доклад. Ну, я по-русски. Почему скорости нейтралов вниз больше, чем вверх, чем заряженных? Почему скорости нейтралов больше, чем скорости заряженных? Окей, я буду переводить, если это поможет. Он спрашивает, почему они нейтральные, они имеют больше скорости, чем заряженные в этих моделях. So this is because we have Lorentz force acting on charges, okay, and that produces you larger force essentially. So if you have larger force, you have larger speeds. And for neutrals, you don't have this. Okay, neutrals they only feel the Lorentz force of collisions with these charges. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no more questions. So I think we can we can close the, the talk. Thank you very much, okay. Elena, for this wonderful talk.